Good uh, afternoon. My name is Jeff Todd with Wolfram Research, and my talk today is going to be on enterprise deployment technologies. So let's jump right in. So what are we going to be discussing today? Uh, we're going to be talking about options for deploying your Wolfram language code. We'll be talking about when each deployment option makes the most sense, and also some in, uh, industry use cases for these deployed technologies. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit at the end about how to get started uh, for these technologies that maybe uh, sound good to you. Um, I also would advocate going to a follow talk at 3.30 on developing with Wolfram Enterprise Private Cloud by my colleague, Joel Klein, and I'll mention that again at the end of the talk. So the Wolfram deployment options that I'm going to be talking about today are the Wolfram Enterprise License with Enterprise CDF and Notebook. Um, the CDF file type is soon to be replaced by Notebook. So if you see it go away, um, I'm sure you'll see things to that, that uh, aspect, but um, that's what's happening. So it's going to be called no longer the free CDF player. It's already the free Wolfram player. Um, so just a, a slight note on that. We'll be talking about the Wolfram Engine, which is a new offering from us, and then Wolfram Enterprise Private Cloud. Um, if I have time, I will talk briefly about Wolfram Applications server, but I know that my colleague Joel Klein will also be talking a little bit about it in his talk. So first, I think I wanted to talk about why deploy in Wolfram. Um, I think there are a lot of advantages to deployment in Wolfram. A lot of them are the same advantages for why you work uh, in Wolfram language. The first is that it's the fattest, fastest prototyping and development language available. Um, you know, the super functions, the meta algorithms, we provide a, a progressively higher level environment every release for being able to do work efficiently and quickly. And we'll see some examples in the use cases where that ties directly into why they wanted to choose Wolfram um, and use us as their platform. Also, it's mostly connected to almost everything. Obviously, new things come about and we are working furiously to continue to connect to everything we can. Um, um, but from databases, 180 plus different file formats, APIs, other programming languages, the Internet of Things, we try to make it as flexible and useful uh, for you as a, as a programming language uh, to maintain that connectivity. And then lastly, the integrated system with access to hundreds of application areas. So the fact that Mathematica is not just about math, the Wolfram language is not just about math, it's about building on three decades of development across machine learning and neural nets and image processing and visualization, geometry and data data science, and all kinds of different areas that give you a lot of flexibility and power when you're working on handling complex solution, uh, solutions, especially in today's world. I think it's important to note that we, we develop horizontally and vertically so that we can provide you with a flexible and powerful language. Um, you know, on the right hand side are a lot of different uh, tools that you might be familiar with and even use. Um, on the left hand side is really just our documentation uh, demonstrating that we have a lot of uh, analogous functionality to many of these third party packages. Um, and if we can help you uh, limit uh, the amount of third-party packages that you would have to use in your solutions, that's another great reason why developing and deploying uh, in the Wolfram language can be a great thing, save you a bunch of time, and there'll be some uh, use cases where that came uh, uh, directly was relevant to their case. Uh, we also evolve with every content release, as many of you know. Um, the fact that you're here at the Wolfram Technology Conference probably means that you've uh, been with us for a while or at least had interest in a while. Uh, and so it's every release for us, the content releases are not just a handful of charts and graphs and a couple new pieces of documentation. As many of you already know, it's in entire broad areas, hundreds potentially uh, of uh, functions in image processing, parallel computation, IoT, machine machine learning, neural nets, new burgeoning areas, uh, bleeding edge technology that we come out with. And so uh, basing your uh, deployment on our language means that you will be getting a steady stream and supply of new functionality along the way um, that should and hopefully be useful to you as, uh, as technology advances. So let's jump right into the first development uh, deployment technology, which is Enterprise CDF or Notebook soon. Um, for those of you who have never seen a CDF uh, or understand you know, what that really means, what we mean by Enterprise CDF is kind of like what you're looking at here. Uh, it's a, an interface using a lot of the user interface uh, GUI uh, functions that are available in Wolfram. Um, one of the things that you would provide is, is immediate results. So a lot of times you want to provide an interactive report, an interactive tool or an application to someone where they are able to um, walk through the computations that you've created, the models, the algorithms, um, the data that you want them to look at and visualize. And it gives them not only a way to do that, you could do that in a static document like 
a PDF, but it gives them a way to move and migrate through the various models, the data, the computations, and make what if scenario kinds of questions. So you can see here um, with this sort of example of a retirement calculator, um, you know, there are various things. Most of us are probably familiar with this. Um, you know, on the on the internet, you can go in and just log into something that looks very much like this. Um, and who knows, it might be powered by um, some kind of uh, a cloud-based or, or Wolfram product. But uh, as you move the sliders back and forward, you can see things change in real time. Uh, and that's kind of what the nature of the CDF, uh, enterprise CDF uh, goes to. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what makes the difference between a regular free CDF and an enterprise CDF. There are also standalone documents that include computation and the computational power is all built into the document that you're providing to people. And we'll show a couple of you cases that will uh, highlight you know, why that is really great and important. So what is a Wolfram Enterprise license? So Wolfram Enterprise is a class of license that allows you to generate what we call uh, enterprise CDFs, computable document format, or enterprise notebooks. The enterprise CDF or notebook can be opened, viewed, and used within the free Wolfram player that anyone can download at the only required runtime. There's no purchase. And so the model is that the author, you, would use the enterprise license to create these active, uh, interactive applications, reports, and then offer those up to your consumers. And those consumers might be management, might be colleagues, it might be friends, it might be uh, customers. Uh, there's a wide variety of the, who those consumers might be, as well as the type of thing that you might want to deploy to them. So examples could be engineers might want to develop a specific or proprietary application within their organization. Um, a lot of times that I've found these are living uncomfortably in Excel in today's world. Um, they are often, you know, kind of kludged together. Excel is not a great environment for that to take place. And so uh, having Wolfram and Enterprise CDF as an alternative to that as a way of deploying these uh, more complex and sophisticated models is a great thing. Data scientists may want to deploy interactive reports or dashboards to management to better visualize and understand, um, but as well as explore and interrogate the data and concept and models. This goes, I think many of you who have been in those meetings, uh, definitely can understand that workflow where you see um, some example that you've worked up uh, data analytics, some kind of data science result, and um, some manager or a colleague is asking a question about this, that, or the other. And if that's just a static report, then that means we'll talk about it next week. Uh, if it's a enterprise CDF, that means we can talk about it right now. We can move these sliders, we can push these buttons, we can see the effect on those live computations, we can see the charts and graphs change in real time. So it's, it's a really progressive and, and a great way to help visually convey the concepts and decisions that you're making. Um, lastly, departments may want to develop tools for their members. That could be salespeople or marketers or engineers or scientists utilize out in the field on uh, uh, where they work or to customers or to deliver to clients. Um, there's a wide variety of what you might want to create with an enterprise CDF. So one question I often hear is, well, I already have Mathematica or Wolfram 1, and I can export CDFs and notebooks now, so what's the difference? Well, the free CDF that can come out of a, what we call a Mathematica standard license um, has some limitations, and those on this list are sort of uh, denoted by the lower right-hand corner under Enterprise CDF. And that is on an Enterprise CDF, you can import and export live data. So I can bring in new data to a CDF, whereas with a free CDF, I'm not able to. I have to encapsulate all the data that I would want to show someone in that initial CDF I give to them. It also allows you to link to additional languages, Java, R, things of that nature, and enterprise CDF, where you can't do that kind of linking in the free CDF. Same with source code encryption. With an enterprise CDF, I may be deploying algorithms that are sensitive or proprietary to my organization. I may be giving a tool that uses those algorithms to a customer, and I don't want that customer to be able to see that or reverse engineer it or, or know what I'm doing. Uh, and so I can encrypt those enterprise CDFs. And then lastly, custom dialogues and other spawn documents. Really what that kind of means is you have arbitrary input that you're able to put in not just integers, but it could be text, it could be drag and drop an image, it could be a sound file, it could be loading in an Excel file, it could be all kinds of uh, expressions that I want to include and give the user the ability to bring those in, as well as spawn documents. So I want to be able to create a PDF or a JPEG or um, a text file or some kind of thing out of uh, this tool that I've created in Enterprise CDF. So 
one thing to those who are not familiar uh, with Wolfram and with some of the, the Wolfram underlying functionality, I just very quickly wanted to talk about um, manipulate and dynamic uh, because you're going to see a lot of use cases and those use cases are going to be, you're going to seeing these interfaces. So very quickly, I want to highlight that in Wolfram language, um, you know, we, we've developed a way where I can have a function like plot the sine of X and I get this nice two dimensional sine wave. I could use a function like table and I can get a variety of those waves. But back in 2007, we created manipulate and manipulate allows you to parameterize uh, any part of really any equation, any model, any algorithm, and be able to give that parameter some reasonable range. And then you're rewarded with an interface that I can move my, my widget, I can control it. In this case, it's a slider, but it might be a drop down menu, it might be a radio button. Um, but you can see that in real time, I can make these changes and, and the visualization updates in real time. And this is very useful for people who are used to using applications, obviously, as a deployed technology, because I can simulate and create these kinds of things. And also, just so you know, when you see these kinds of interfaces later, you'll know that you know it's not thousands of lines of code to create that. In some cases, it might only be one, two, three, four lines of code. In the same way, you can use dynamic to very quickly and easily create sort of nested uh, functions um, that create you know, an input field here and then a result where the, you can give the user um, the ability to type in kind of whatever they want um, and be able to get out uh, a re result. Um, and that is very useful as well because as a developer, you can't always know everything that the user might want to be able to put in there. So giving them the freedom to be able to put in what they want uh, can be largely very effective. So I thought we'd start with a fun use case, which was my 2010 NCAA basketball tournament bracket application. Uh, this was my first application I ever wrote in Wolfram language. Uh, it was developed right after the ability to sign CDS was, you could do that out of your license. You didn't have to upload it to the Wolfram website for people that remember those days. Um, and it was also the days when we still had an NCAA basketball tournament to watch. So uh, good times uh, uh, in 2010. The, uh, I was actually very impressed. This is This is literally just, copy and pasted from the notebook that I used to, to create this. Um, but as you can see, you know, I had tabs that you can walk through. I have all my teams I can pick, um, you know, resetting brackets and making these various choices. Um, obviously, these are just all constructs that are part of the language that I, you know, programmed to be able to, you know, show me the visualization of the school. I could pick, you know, two of these teams in this area and click on a button and have it compare those two teams and all their various stats and tell me which one I should probably go for. Uh, this probably has been true for a long time. Um, but I was very impressed that uh, one thing that was very helpful to me uh, is you can take this, you can put this into a new notebook, so it's just by itself. We'll paste that in there. And then I can go to file in my Mathematic, and I have an enterprise license right now, and I can do preview for Wolfram Player. So if I've created an interface and I want to see what this will look like for uh, my people um, that I'm going to be giving it to, I can use that, and then I can come back here and see that everything is behaving correctly. Um, I can make these same kind of determinations. I can see that the pop-up windows are all working. I can see that it populates correctly when I make all these choices. I can see maybe some of these other buttons are working, so on and so forth. I was just very impressed that this document 10 years later uh, works without me having to change one single thing into this technology. So hopefully that shows the backwards compatibility that you can expect out of uh, Wolfram and Wolfram technology. So on to more real world cases. Uh, so the first one is uh, Chicago Bridge and Iron. Um, CBNI, which is now part of McDermott, um, became known for uh, designing uh, engineering and field uh, construction of large scale storage tanks, really huge process vessels and, and steel plate structures. Um, these are the kinds of things that when you see them, you kind of wonder how man would make such a thing. Um, they use enterprise CDF and notebooks to provide tools to over 500 of their engineers. Um, the CDFs that they use uh, generally surround proprietary proprietary engineering related tasks that are associated with their large scale builds. And I've seen um, everything from, you know, how to fit the appropriate amount of plates around some gigantic sphere, as well as accounting for weight and all that kind of thing, as well as how to wrap stairs efficiently to be able to, uh, you know, go up without needlessly endangering said technician that needs to get on top of these gigantic uh, monstrosities. Um, in this case, uh, the example that they were uh, nice enough to send over um, was related to a cone cylinder inner section layout. Um, the thing about this is used by detailers, they obtain plate layout dimensions and then determine the plate cutout. Um, obviously, they can't show the entire uh, application because there's a lot of proprietary stuff in there. Um, one of the things that I like to highlight, though, is with enterprise CDF and notebooks, you're able 
able to create, in this case, you know, the, the logo, their own kind of color scheme. They've got some nice drop down menus that, you know, have about and getting started at link to documentation. Um, there's a lot of great tools that give you the ability to kind of customize and create the user interfaces. Um, and then in this case, you can kind of see what I was talking about before. We have these input fields that they've obviously nested in here, um, and as well as with the output that would be expected. So the consumer of this deployed technology doesn't need to know anything about Wolfram. They don't need to know anything about code. They're just taking the uh, hard work that you've created and using a very easy to use interface and obtaining those results. And then sort of building on what we had talked about before with the difference between a free CDF and an enterprise CDF would be with generating this engineering report. You know, it's a summary of the user input and it generates a report. And in this case, I've got two buttons here, the notebook and Excel. So I can generate this out as a Mathematica or Wolfram language notebook, or I can generate this out as an Excel document. And I think that's, you know, very useful to be able to create tools that will not only work with our own technology, but will give people tools they need to be able to go on to a next step. And that next step very well, well be that they need to deliver something in Excel or a text file or a CSV file uh, or a JPEG to someone that is the result of the work they've done in this, this CDF. The next uh, enterprise CDF I want to talk about is from Assured Flow. Uh, so Assured Flow works in the oil and gas area. They help companies basically efficiently extract and manage the flow of oil and gas to minimize the environmental impact and also to maximize revenue uh, and the safety in their labs and, and engineering and tech services. So they use the enterprise CDF um, as well as engine, as well as cloud in the delivery of analytic tools in an easy to use application style environment. And rather than me tell you about how great it is and everything, I thought I would share just a, a snippet of uh, a video from Andrew Yule um, talking about uh, why they like to use it. I think it comes in a lot on the back end of that is analyzing that data, post-processing that data, doing you know extra calculations on top of it, um, and just having a tool that allows me to manipulate data, a lot of data at one time is really valuable. Kind of the heart of what we try to do with it, I think, is solve a problem that a lot of businesses face. And that was basically how do you capture your company's intellectual property in a, in a consistent and maintainable way. And what we ended up using was the Wolfram language to do exactly that. We have a project that we call Alex, and it was basically our attempt to try to capture all of our previous knowledge that was in the form of spreadsheets and maintain it so that it was consistent and that people knew exactly where they could go to reach a particular type of calculation that they wanted. How I use the Wolfram language um, daily, it's I use um, things like Eclipse for the pure sort of development. Um, and then we're more and more starting to use the cloud as well. We'll send calculations to, to one another. I'll send something to a colleague. Um, we even use the, the cloud API to, to build small little applications that our clients can, can utilize the Wolfram language on the back end without necessarily knowing that, that that's what they're doing. It's the ability to write, you know, one line of code that'll accomplish ten things at once. And and if you've ever tried to do something like that in Excel, you, you can't many times. Tools like the Wolfram language um, offer a really powerful alternative to things like Excel. And I think that if people were willing to, you know, spend a little bit of time learning um, what is out there and, and what it's capable of, I think those benefits would really pay off. Thank you, Andrew. So these are briefly uh, some of the images that he was showing um, in that of the Alex. Uh, this is all in the CDF player. You can kind of see up here the, the CDF player, but you can also see they did a very nice job of, uh, of making this their own and having their own nice aesthetic um, and having a really great you know, delineation of, of the different tools they can choose along with the tool that would come up for their engineers to use. So I, I thought this was a, a great tool um, and a great use case. Uh, last use case for enterprise CDF, um, Enterprise CDFs allow you to inform the audience kind of through rich visualizations and live computations and allows them to ask these questions of the data or the model, the scenario, and kind of show people why we're making decisions that we are. And so um, I, that made me think of Agilus Energy, which is now part of Train. Uh, Train, as probably many of you know, is an HVAC company. You probably know of them or maybe even have uh, an air conditioner or furnace in your, in your house. Um, Agilus first introduced this tool to Train to help their commercial customers um, understand how to save 
money uh, by their energy consumption and perform analytics that would expose you know over expenditures and supported changes in their power usage patterns and the CDF they created uh, as a tool was for their salespeople um, that would give them a variety of ways to view uh, visualizations of the building energy weather data things of that nature um, so here I just kind of have a a visualization of what that looks like. Um, in this case, they were visualizing, you know, about a year of, of data um, in a three-dimensional way of, of one of their commercial properties. And uh, they would use this to help uh, show and convince the managers of those businesses that of the behavior. Um, because many times they would say, well, you should be changing. You don't need to kick on your furnaces or you don't need to kick on the air conditioners so early um, that we're seeing here. You can wait until this time. And, and many times without this kind of data, without this kind of visualization, without a tool like this, they would get a lot of resistance, but being able to couple the analytics along with a very easy to understand, easy to use visualization tool um, in an enterprise CDF uh, made it very easy for them to go in and provide them with a lot of different information um, to make their case. And in many cases, they would be able to go in and save, you know, tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for these places. Um, and they was using a really nice interface that had many different tabs, many different screens, many different tools, all coupled together and designed all in the Wolfram language and deployed with enterprise CDF. So the next uh, technology I want to talk about is the Wolfram Engine. Um, Wolfram Engine is a relatively new offering from Wolfram. So the first question would be kind of, what is it for? Uh, so the Wolfram Engine is at, actually at the heart of many Wolfram technologies in Mathematica and Wolfram 1 and Wolfram Alpha. I'm offering up its library of thousands of built-in functions for use with your software engineering or reporting or computing infrastructure. Um, you can call a Wolfram Engine from a command line um, as a script through sockets or through 0MQ. You can also call it through client libraries like Python and Java and .NET and C as well as systems like Excel or Jupyter or Unity. Um, and so whereas Mathematica is used primarily for interactive computing via the notebook, the Wolfram Engine is intended to be called by other programs using a variety of communication interfaces. So kind of what is it designed to do? So ultimately the Wolfram Engine supplements and supports your existing solutions by providing access to its thousands of built-in functions as well as your specifically developed functions that you've made with the Wolfram language to existing programs or creating automated workflows. So some examples would be, I wanna create a scheduled task that feeds data into a Wolfram Engine and produce a report every morning that gets emailed out to management. I don't, I don't necessarily need a, a front end you know, user version of Mathematica to do that. I just want an engine to be able to handle that task for me. Or I have the Wolfram Engine sit on the back end of an existing tool um, and occasionally being used to apply machine learning or image processing or natural language algorithm that I developed in the Wolfram language but want to have used in this other environment. Um, or I want to embed a Wolfram Engine into a device like an MRI machine that maybe performs routine predictive maintenance and diagnostics and reports issues or errors and warnings to the owner or the manufacturer. You know, these are all things that the Wolfram Engine could be used for. Um, and I have a couple of uh, use cases. So actually, Assured Flow, who we just heard from, um, also uses the Wolfram Engine. So in this case, they created a front end using React, but it makes all the calls from the Wolfram Engine. So they mentioned that we have a pretty impressive application written in React for the front end, but the math and everything is done and powered by the Wolfram Engine behind the scenes. And these were just a couple of, uh, of examples of what those two uh, the interfaces look like that they created in React. So obviously we have a bunch of input fields um, that will be then parsed into code and then uh, you know made uh, sent over to the Wolfram engine. The engine will compute and then return the results in the form of graphs and the form of, of various output. So it can be a very useful tool to be able to have um, just a machine somewhere that's handling this in an automated fashion and generate those kind of reports. A second use case for this would be the Xbox and HoloLens team at Microsoft, uh, where they test computer vision on a headless server. So uh, Wolfram Engine sits on a server and it responds to various calls as they test a variety of proprietary computer vision algorithms that are written in the Wolfram language. And um, I think this is a great use case because one of the reasons why they use Wolfram is these algorithms will eventually be rewritten and likely compiled um, for absolute speed when they get moved into a product like the Xbox. But the speed at which you can prototype the new algorithms and test and refine and test um, in the Wolfram language which allows them to refine and perfect those computer uh, vision algorithms much more quickly. And so one uh, you know, obvious use case for a Wolfram engine is, you know, we want to use the high level and, and, and efficient nature of the Wolfram language to do a bunch of our testing and algorithmic or modeling work until we get it narrowed down to what we want best, and then we'll move forward uh, with that. And I think that's a great use for, for something like a Wolfram engine. 
So the last technology we're going to talk about is the Wolfram Enterprise Private Cloud. Um, I'm sure you guys, uh, many of you have heard of the regular public cloud. So I know of Wolfram Cloud, but how is the Enterprise Private Cloud different or what is it? Um, so the EPC is what we call the Enterprise Private Cloud, is, is the most modern way for you to deploy your web-based Wolfram language content in the form of applications or forms or reports or tools or the fastest way of deploying just APIs to your many services or applications or programs. Um, the EPC is a self-contained appliance consisting of a web application that's installed on a virtual machine running CentOS. Um, it includes access to all Wolfram Cloud web interfaces um, with additional tools for, for resource management, user authentication, personalization. Uh, the EPC can be installed on-prem, which is usually on a Linux box and behind your firewalls, or on an AWS, which is hosted by you or hosted by us. Um, the EPC provides you with a centralized you know, file management, a web browser-based interfaces for developing and viewing and sharing notebooks, uh, as well as inter additional uh, features that you would want for deploying uh, APIs, forms, manipulate objects, and, and other interfaces. So I know some people are familiar with web mathematic and they would ask, you know, how is EPC different? So, you know, EPC is sort of the future, it's the next evolution, it's the next generation. Um, even on this just basic of charts, um, there's a lot of things that you get with the EPC, especially from the, the web-based interactive side, um, the ability to instantly create deployments. I don't have to manually write a bunch of stuff um, and, and code and implement it in HTML and have it be represented uh, in JSP. I can just use functions that have been designed specifically for this new technology like cloud deploy, uh, API function, uh, form function, things of that nature that allow me to very quickly create these constructs and deploy those. Obviously, the notebooks, um, being able to have those uh, represented in the web browser is really important and really helpful. Things like Wolfram One or Programming Lab or Mathematica Online are all usable within an enterprise private cloud, uh, which makes collaboration between employees and documentation of things that you are making very, very useful. Um, and then, of course, cloud storage, file management, everything you'd expect to come along with that um, is built into the EPC and certainly, you know, doesn't have anything like that for Web Mathematica. So some commonly asked questions about the EPC, uh, it doesn't require the internet. It can be installed on a Linux box, could be fully installed and deployed within your internet. So some people are sometimes concerned that it's always going to be calling out or needs to talk to Wolfram or needs to talk to the internet, and that's not the case. It can also make connections with, with databases, file systems, programming languages, you know, kind of any way into your technology stack in a variety of ways that, that would bring value. And then the EPC has a, a pool of kernels, you know, session kernels, deployment kernels, service kernels. Um, they each do their own thing. Session kernels for people who are using, you know, the online web-based uh, environment for developing. Deployment kernels for people who um, are designing uh, APIs, designing forms, designing tools where people are dragging sliders or clicking buttons or hitting a submit button. And then service kernels for, for dedicated um, tasks or jobs that need to run at a particular time. So I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time and just talk about a handful of use cases. So Innova International um, you know, is a financial lending company. Um, and it used to be that small businesses needing loans would have to wait weeks or months for a decision from their provider you know, with pre-qualification steps taking a, a long time. And even after that, there was no guarantee that uh, you, would, you would be approved. Um, and then you know, after that, you know, it would be days uh, before you'd find out if you would get the money. Um, but in today, you know, AI can do a lot of that heavy lifting. And so Innova created a platform called Colossus, which uses machine learning and sophisticated decision flows to make basic operational decisions that were related to fraud and credit risk and operations um, and, and determining whether customers are fraudulent or whether their risk level is, is, is of a level where the bank should accept them or what kind of offer they should be extended. Um, and this automated platform runs 24 seven, serving peaks of 20,000 applicants an hour, all using Wolfram technology on the back end. And uh, this is from a talk they gave several years ago. Um, basically their process is there's you know, an application, um, it's easy to complete, it's quick, um, the underwriting, the decisioning that they've designed in their analytics system is, it happens in three to six seconds. Um, the advanced analytics that are, are integrated, you know, have a hundred algorithms, a thousand different variables, 10 years of, of customer behavior data uh, informing all those. Um, and then they accept agreements reviewed online and they move forward. One of the things that stuck with me the most was they mentioned, you know, some of the metrics from adopting Wolfram um, for their process, using their old system, a model would take an average of one to one and a half months to deploy in production. Colossus had reduced that to 1.5 to two weeks. And um, then any minor changes that they wanted to make previously would take one to two weeks and now only took a few hours. So that was a huge, a huge efficiency improvement. And uh, they had been using SAS and Ruby, moved to only uh, Wolfram uh, language and, and got a lot of uh, value out of that. 
Uh, another use case would be um, with Pearson. They'd written a, a book, Eric Schultz um, at Walla Walla Community College, along with several other authors, had written an ebook called Calculus. Um, it used to be uh, deployed actually in uh, Enterprise CDF, but now Eric and Pearson have been moving Calculus into a Wolfram private cloud environment. And so if we go here, um, we can take a look at what that looks like. And I really like this example and the fine work that Eric's been doing um, in, in showcasing how you can use the cloud to also have documents, um, you know, kind of live uh, uh, interesting documents where I can uh, click through uh, a marriage of, of text and graphics and manipulate objects and, and different kinds of things that a user would be able to see and interact with. And so for people who want to have really great documentation, really good training services, um, I think this use case is, is a really great job of highlighting what's possible in having a nicely formatted, uh, easily readable, easily navigable um, interface where there's you know, text related to all the various uh, 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 concepts they're trying to uh, convey, as well as um, down here just a little bit, you know, there's even a couple of areas where I can, I can make selections you know, and change you know, the parameters of these various calculations um, and see those pretty much in, in real time, uh, which is very helpful. So um, seeing something deployed in the Wolfram Cloud like this um, at this level and, and with this complexity uh, for this kind of use cases is really exciting. And then the last use case, trying to get you out here as fast as possible, but I think it'd be great to end on, is uh, actual Emerald Labs. They have a thing called Cloud Lab. Um, and basically, it's a multi-million dollar lab that you can remotely control through Wolfram Language and through the cloud. You come into an interface, you, you click your buttons, um, you make your choices to run experiments, you, you click a button, off goes this remote lab that runs all of your various uh, experiments. You get back your data and a bunch of graphs and, and uh, uh, analytics options for being able to look through the data. And uh, I will go ahead and end with a, a, just a little intro video from them on that, um, showcasing kind of one of the better use cases of, of the Wolfram Cloud itself. As chemists and biologists, we've always been firmly bound to the laboratory. For us, the scope and limitations of scientific exploration have been defined by the instruments we have, and the scale of our work has been metered by the long hours required at the bench. It's time to change that. Emerald Cloud Lab is a remote-controlled life science laboratory that allows scientists to execute their experiments without being anchored to a physical lab. In a cloud lab, experiments are driven by issuing commands over the internet, which are then run in a vast, highly automated central facility. With an ECL account, you have full control over every aspect of how your experiments are conducted. Control the transfers of volumes from less than a microliter to 20 liters, and the transfers of solids with masses from micrograms to kilograms. There are over 100 different models of best-in-class instrumentation online at the ECL. ECL facilities run your experiments on demand 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, leaving just hours between the moment you conceive your experiment and the moment you receive your results. It's not unusual for an ECL user to be orchestrating dozens of protocols simultaneously, far more than one could ever manage in a traditional laboratory. When you're ready, you can build scripts which automatically execute a series of experiments of arbitrary complexity, reproduce results, or process the data and generate reports for you to analyze. As chemists and biologists, our minds are capable of moving faster and further than the laboratory has ever allowed us. Take your seat in the command center. Transcend the lab.
So I thought it was a great use case. Um, you guys probably recognized a lot of uh, code and uh, visualizations that there. Um, so I know we're, we're three minutes over. I really appreciate your time and seeing today. Uh, if you are interested in, if, you know, in anything that you've seen today and want to have further discussions, certainly feel free to reach out. Um, with Mathematic Enterprise Edition, you, know, you, you can upgrade to that. You can get a new one if you want that. Wolfram Engine is actually free to download for testing. So feel free to just uh, search for that or reach out. We can get you hooked up um, with, uh, with that information. And then the Enterprise Private Cloud, happy to have conversations around that for anything you're interested in deploying with that. Um, I will let you go. I know there's some 3.30 classes happening. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming, and I appreciate it. Have a great day.